Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's event, Animal Agriculture's Climate Lobbying and Misinformation Strategies with Georgina Dustin. I'm Rebecca Morris. I'm the Executive Director of the Law, Ethics, and Animals Program at Yale Law School, and this is the first of three events in our Spring 2024 Speaker Series. First, uh, thank you to today's co-sponsors of this event. There are many of them. The Pointer Fellowship in Journalism, the Yale Animal Law Society and Environmental Law Association, the Yale Environmental Humanities Initiative, and the Yale Sustainable Food Program. Um, before I introduce Georgina, two quick logistical notes. First, um, please know that the opinions and statements expressed in this talk are the speaker's own personal views and don't represent the views of the university. Um, and second, this event is being recorded and will be available on LEAP's YouTube channel later this semester. Okay, with that, we are thrilled and so honored to welcome Georgina Gustin um, to speak about her work reporting on the animal agriculture industry, its climate impacts, and the industry's efforts to shape our understanding and public policy about those impacts. Since the mid-2000s, as I know many of you know and, and conduct research on here as well, an ever-growing body of research has highlighted the need to rein in the livestock industry's significant greenhouse gas emissions. Even if fossil fuel use ended overnight, um, current projections estimate that global emissions related to food production alone are on course to make it impossible for us to limit warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the vast majority of that warming, over 50%, is uh, due to meat and dairy. Um, and so we know collectively that the role of a, a handful of companies are particularly important in this. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions of 15 of the largest meat and dairy companies are now ex um, estimated to exceed those of some oil giants like ExxonMobil. Um, and this is particularly significant when you look at methane and nitrous oxide. Yet, even though we've known about this for years, measures to effectively reduce livestock-related emissions are rarely at the forefront of environmental policy. Um, so this begs the question as to why, you know, why is that? And our guest today has revealed through her pioneering work um, that a big part of the answer appears to be that the livestock industry and its associated industries have played key roles in shaping public understanding and public policy in a multitude of ways to ensure that they can continue to conduct business as usual. You know, how agriculture companies um, operate and how they contribute to the climate crisis is, of course, um, a topic of profound consequence for all of us and for the planet. And yet, it's really surprisingly overlooked. And this, you know, general lack of scrutiny and I think also sort of a general lack um, for many years of investigative journalism makes Georgina Gustin's work all the more remarkable, um, exceptional, and important. Um, Georgina is an uh, extraordinary and leading investigative reporter focused on the intersection of farming, food policy, and the environment. If you haven't read her work firsthand, um, I can't recommend it highly enough. Her reporting is nuanced, it's um, often groundbreaking, and it really, I think, demonstrates the value of having investigative rep reporters with deep subject matter expertise on agriculture's many facets. Um, Georgina writes for Inside Climate News. Uh, her work has won numerous awards, including um, twice winning an award for Agricultural Journalist of the Year in North America, um, and awards for Distinguished Environmental Journalism as well. Um, and her stories, in addition to Inside Climate News, have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, National Geographic, among other publications. So Georgina is going to speak to us for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to turn to audience Q&A. Um, if you want any more food, the salads are going rapidly, so um, please, please seize the opportunity um, and join me in welcoming Georgina Houston. Thank you. Um, my head has just gotten twice the size it was when I walked into this room. <laughs> Thank you. And I should also caveat that um, um, as a journalist, I have no views. So <laughs> um, uh, I can't remember what the, the, the title was, actually. But it was a good long title that I think we worked on together for this talk. Um, a more concise title, um, but maybe l less nuanced, is perhaps a uh, Poop is the problem. Um, so I'll try to get to that a, a little bit here. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Better? Did you guys get all of that? The most important thing being poop is the problem. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, my understanding of uh, this program is, uh, of the LEAP program, that is, is that you're mostly concerned with animal welfare and treatment and working towards policy that addresses those issues. Um, the focus of my reporting over the last eight years in particular has been on the impact of uh, agriculture on climate change and the impact of climate change on agriculture. And because uh, I write about agriculture through the lens of climate change or climate change through the lens of agriculture, I write a lot about livestock. 
And there's a lot of overlap between the welfare of livestock and the climate crisis. And I think the, that overlap is becoming clearer and more prominent and from a climate perspective, more problematic. Um, I realize that everybody in this room is, um, maybe has different levels of understanding of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and animal agriculture. And so I'm gonna speak probably uh, in a way that might be way too basic for maybe all of you. So I apologize for that. I'll also be using um, a lot of really unwieldy uh, names and acronyms. And so I apologize for that also. Um, so I I'm going to echo a little bit of what Vivica said Viveka said, um, and, and that is that um, agriculture is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, um, emitting more than all of the cars, trucks, boats, and planes on the planet in a given year. Uh, but the percentages, the how much of that, depends on how you calculate the total. The Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the EPA, says U.S. emissions from agriculture are about 10%. Global estimates put that number at about 25% or even higher, more than a third. If you calculate emissions from throughout the life cycle of the food system from farm to fork and include deforestation and land use change and food waste. But take the EPA's figure of 10% of US emissions, which I will put an asterisk by for now. Uh, that 10% includes the big trinity of agricultural pollutants. Those are methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. Uh, nitrous oxide emissions come largely from fertilizer application and carbon dioxide from land conversion and deforestation. Uh, the latter isn't really happening in the U.S. Uh, in fact, the opposite is happening. We're actually losing farmland in this country. Uh, I think 20 million acres, according to the last ag census, but I will have to check on that. Uh, globally, agriculture is the biggest driver of deforestation, uh, mostly from clearing land to graze livestock or grow feed for livestock. And that, of course, releases a lot of CO2. But the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture is methane, and that comes mostly from enteric emissions. Uh, cows and other ruminants that eat grass emit methane in their burps from a biological process in their guts. Uh, they also... Uh, emit methane in their flatulence, but not as much as from their burps. Sorry, you're eating. Um, uh, methane is also emitted from manure, especially when it's stored in huge pits or lagoons. Uh, livestock, mostly cattle, are the biggest source of methane globally. That surprises a lot of people, but um, maybe most of you in this room know that. And they become a much bigger source over time as the world's herd has ballooned along with demand. Uh, reporting by my colleague and I, uh, my, my uh, colleague Phil McKenna and I at Inside Climate News, found that in 2020, cows emitted more than twice as much methane from their burps and manure as all of the country's oil and gas wells. Um, since the early 1960s, the amount of beef produced globally has roughly doubled to, 20, to 76 million tons or so. Dairy production has also shot up globally and in the U.S. Methane, of course, is a powerful greenhouse gas. It's the second biggest contributor to global warming after carbon dioxide, responsible for about 30% of atmospheric heating over the last two centuries. But it lasts in the atmosphere for a shorter time than carbon dioxide. That means that cutting emissions of methane is especially critical and especially expedient way to reduce greenhouse gases. So go back to the 10% from EPA, and let's assume that's accurate. Uh, it might not sound like a lot, but 10% of U.S. emissions is equivalent to the annual emissions of Canada. And the half of that, between 4 or 5% attributed to livestock, is more than the annual greenhouse gas emissions of Spain. That's all uh, are cow burps and poop from pigs, poultry, and cows combined. But as Viveka uh, referenced, I, I should talk about what we don't know and why we don't know it, uh, which might make us question that 10% number, as well as some other emissions data reported to and by the EPA. Uh, a little bit of history here, sorry. Um, when lawmakers were crafting our bed 
bedrock environmental laws, the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act in the 60s and 70s, they didn't factor in agricultural pollution. They didn't count on it becoming an environmental problem and definitely not a climate problem. I've been told by people at the EPA that it just didn't occur to them or perhaps to lawmakers at the time that agriculture would become such a significant source of water and air pollution. But then the way we raise livestock in this country started to change. Farmers brought animals inside or into feedlots and into what we now call animal feeding operations, or if they're really big, concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. The argument from many farmers at the time was that this confinement and bringing animals inside was better for the animals. It sheltered them from the elements, it prevented sickness. But as you all know, it enabled a kind of radical efficiency, a, fa a factory model that made it possible to raise animals faster and more cheaply. From the late 1970s until now, we've seen a huge uptick in the number of animals raised in confinement in huge, farm, in huge farms, a rise that continues. This goes for all of the major livestock types that, re that we raise in the US, cattle, dairy cows, hogs, and chickens. And this is my hypothesis here, but it was around this time in the early 1980s when the farm lobby started to get really concerned and more organized about environmental regulations. Uh, CAFOs, the sort of beginning of CAFOs at the end of the 70s and early 80s, really started to galvanize the industry. Uh, for starters, the American Farm Bureau, the country's biggest agricultural lobby group and a very powerful force in Congress, called for an end to the Environmental Protection Agency. And that was just the first and somewhat blunt step in a long <laughs> and continuing campaign. And since then, for the most part, the Farm Bureau and its allies in Congress have been very effective at ensuring that environmental regulations don't touch American farms. Even the Department of Agriculture, which is basically a marketing agency, not a regulator, has helped ensure that the EPA doesn't regulate livestock agriculture. And sorry to my friends at the USDA, but there you have it. Um, <laughs> uh, federal law gives the EPA the authority to regulate water and air pollution from CAFOs. Uh, the Clean Water Act requires CAFOs, like any other polluting industry, to obtain permits. Uh, acronym, sorry, uh, National Pollution Discharge Elimination Permits, or NIPDES, are required for, for disposing of manure when it's released into federal waters. Uh, the EPA gives the responsibility for issuing these permits to states. But government reports from the GAO and analysis after analysis have found that states are uneven at best in issuing these permits, and in some cases, like in Hog Rich, Iowa, regulators don't even know where these CAFOs are or how many there are. And while they don't monitor climate pollution, these NIPDES permits essentially provide a map, a way to evaluate and measure how big CAFOs are and where they are. And it's a map with a lot of holes. It's a very incomplete picture. In 2008, a report by the GAO, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, which is the research arm of Congress, noted that the EPA had attempted to expand its permitting requirements to more CAFOs, but the pork industry, led by the National Pork Producers Council, uh, sued, and the Fifth Circuit said, the regulations, said that the regulations exceeded the agency's uh, authority. Um, again, I'm going to apologize for all the unwieldy names and acronyms here. And again, maybe you know this, probably you do. But uh, there are three separate federal laws, the Clean Air Act, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA, also known as the Superfund Law, and the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, or EPCRA. Um, the first covers CAFOs, the Clean Air Act covers CAFOs, the latter two do not, specifically mention CAFOs, but they require operators of certain facilities to report certain hazardous substances. But the EPA over the years has basically been unsuccessful in regulating air pollution from, care, from CAFOs. And that's largely because the industry and its congressional allies have tied the agency's hands time after time. Or in some cases, the agency simply caved to industry pressure. Here are just a couple of examples. In 1996, 
Congress asked the head of the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is a part of the Department of Agriculture, to launch a task force to look at the impact of agriculture on air quality. The person leading the task force, the person at the USDA, then ask the EPA to exempt CAFOs from any federal legislation, including the Clean Air Act, CERCLA, and EPCRA, until the agency developed an emissions factor, uh, a way of measuring air pollution from CAFOs or anything else. Uh, nearly three decades later, it still has not done that. So no emissions factor, three decades later. Um, although a public comment period on a new rule is imminent, and we'll see. Um, a few years later, uh, the head of EPA's Office of Air and Radiation um, said the agency was exploring ways to exempt CAFOs from reporting under cir CERCLA, which requires reporting of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide, among other things. Soon after, the EPA issued a rule ex exempting CAFOs from reporting leaks of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide and other ha hazardous sub substances under the Superfund law. Uh, the agency exempted all but the largest feeding operations from reporting releases under EPCRA. Uh, this despite the fact that livestock facilities are among the largest producers of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide in the country. And all of what I just said only gets to water and air pollutants. On the matter of greenhouse gas emissions, there's a similar, a similar story. Uh, under the Clean Air Act, uh, EPA has the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, um, although that was curbed a, a bit by a 2022 Supreme Court decision. But the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 reinforces that carbon dioxide from fossil fuels is a climate pollutant. But a rider, or an amendment, introduced and attached to an appropriations bill in 2009 um, exempts agriculture. Um, and it says none of the funds made available in this, this is an appropriations bill, so none of the funds made available in this act or any other act may be used to promulgate or implement any regulation requiring the issuance of permits under Title V of the Clean Air Act for, for carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, water vapor, or methane emissions resulting from the biological processes associated with livestock production. In other words, you can't regulate burps. Um, and in every spending bill since then, so this was 2009, that same amendment has made it into the, the language. Uh, so has a rider or an amendment um, prohibiting any funds being used to require farms to report greenhouse gas emissions to the EPA for its greenhouse gas reporting program. Uh, and that program requires individual facilities like power plants to report annual emissions. Uh, the amendment was introduced by uh, Congressman Tom Latham, a Republican from Iowa, and this is what he said on the House floor that year. It will do nothing to improve the environmental health of rural America. That's what he said about uh, any kind of reporting of, of greenhouse gases or regulation of greenhouse gases. Um, the National Pork Producers Council, um, which has been very active, um, celebrated the success of, Le of Latham's amendment, saying in its annual report that it backed, quote, a measure that stops EPA from implementing in fiscal 2010 any provision requiring livestock operations to report greenhouse gas emissions from manure management systems. Um, and Latham received more campaign money from agriculture than any other sector that year. Um, uh, and Iowa also happens to be a place where the Farm Bureau is especially powerful and wealthy. And of course, the Farm Bureau is very influential here. Um, so that rider has also made it into uh, these uh, appropriations bills every year. Um, and in 2002, after Democrats stripped the language from the bill, Republicans successfully negotiated the provision back in. So no regulation, no reporting. So here's basically where we are with the regulation of these animal facilities. Um, the largest CAFOs need NIPDES, per NIPDES permits, um, even though that is very thinly policed. Um, CAFOs rarely r report toxic air pollutants uh, known to have negative health consequence consequences, and EPA doesn't require them to under the Superfund law. And they don't have to report greenhouse gas emissions, nor does EPA regulate them. So why? 
that is the big question, or a big question. Um, as I alluded to a couple times maybe already, um, the agriculture lobby, the Farm Bureau, is extremely effective and until recently denied that climate change was real and caused by human activity. And it has not only helped fend off regulations that would impact its constituents, farmers, and the millions of people who buy insurance. The Farm Bureau is also basically an insurance company. Um, it has helped scuttle climate regulations more broadly, including the Senate's ratification of the Kyoto Protocol, the first treaty to require cuts in greenhouse gases. Um, so you may wonder what the Farm Bureau has to do with the livestock industry. Um, of course, it represents ranchers as well as farmers. Uh, but the farmers it represents, those who grow row crops like corn and soybeans, benefit from the growth of CAFOs. About half of the country's corn, our biggest crop, goes towards feed. So these industries, they fit together. And as a whole, they've managed to push, push back on most environmental regulations and climate action. And all of what I just said just flicks at only a little bit of it. Uh, but I think the agriculture lobby, uh, which stands largely in the conservative wing of our political spectrum, has very effectively used livestock as a tool in the broader culture wars that have basically split this country. And it has done a very good job of managing its message. In 2009, about the time that the EPA was establishing its greenhouse gas reporting program, which did not include enteric emissions, the farm lobby learned that the EPA had discussed livestock regulations in a technical report. Soon after, they waged a don't tax cow farts campaign to defeat the supposed proposal to tax methane, even though the EPA had never proposed it. Um, feeling some heat from, from the public and from EPA, the don't tax cow farts momentum probably helped gin up excitement and pushback against a mandatory cap and trade bill that Congress was considering and which the farm lobby ultimately worked to defeat. <coughs> Since then, as there's been a growing awareness of the carbon intensity of livestock farming and of cows in particular, the industry has been pushed onto defensive footing. If I had to pick a moment though, when awareness of the climate impacts of livestock farming became um, not quite common knowledge, but entered the public square, I would say it was the release in 2006 of the UN report, Livestock's Long Shadow. Has anybody heard of that? Um, that concluded that nearly 18% of global emissions come from livestock production, and it was a major bombshell at the time. Um, in the preface, the head of FAO's Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO's Animal Health and Pro uh, uh, Production Division said, Quote, the in-depth assessment presented in this document of the various significant impacts of the world's livestock sector on the environment is deliberately termed livestock's long shadow, so as to help raise the attention of both the technical and the general public to the very substantial contribution of animal agriculture to climate change and air pollution, to land, soil, and water degradation, and to the reduction of biodiversity. This is not simply to blame the rapidly growing and intensifying global livestock sector for severely damaging the environment, but to encourage decisive measures at the technical and political levels for mitigating such damage. That's the end of that quote. Uh, it got a lot of attention at the time, and soon after, a lot of pushback from the livestock industry, which indeed felt very much blamed by the report, even though that was not the report's intention. Um, and uh, kind of a side note about the, that uh, about that FAO report. Um, the report, the Guardian just reported late last year, in a series of good stories, um, that researchers at at FAO at the agency were subsequently censored, and that subsequent papers were essentially buried, largely because of pressure on the agency from global meat producers, including the U.S. So basically UN reports and researchers getting suppressed um, because of pressure from the industry, powerful industry. Um, since then, the media coverage of the impact of livestock on the, on the climate has ramped up, especially with big reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, um, saying people should eat less meat in developed countries. Even last year's national climate assessment here in the US suggested that's an annual, uh, is it annual, semi-annual maybe? 
regular report on the state of the climate in, in, in the U.S., um, suggested that lowering beef consumption would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I thought that was really remarkable that it said that. And um, because all the efforts that I'm aware of, like the, the dietary guidelines and all the political fights over suggesting whether we should or should not eat less meat, um, that have basically gone into a black box and never emerged. So this was the first... Uh, time the U.S. government explicitly mentioned reducing beef consumption in a government-sponsored report. It didn't get a lot of attention, which I thought was kind of surprising, but I'm sort of a geek like that. Um, and, you know, all, all of this media coverage has has kind of really ramped up, I would say, in the last five or six years. And just yesterday, there was uh, a story in Bloomberg by a, a former colleague of mine from Inside Climate. Um, the headline was, one simple change to reduce your climate impact, swap out beef. Um, and this is Bloomberg, which has a, a, huge, a huge reach. And um, so the industry feels under siege um, much the same way that the oil industry has or the tobacco industry before it. This is an existential battle for them. Um, but it's a little bit different because people have very personal connections to what they eat. And um, so... They, they kind of have that to their advantage. So their strategies in some cases have been more subtle, as in the formation of a group called the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. This is, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago, um, which attempts to put a, fa a family farming face on industrial scale agriculture and uses taglines like the following, quote, Farmers and ranchers uniquely enable the sustainable food systems of the future of the future by nourishing our communities, natural resources, and planet. Or in an unlikely partnership with environmental groups, there's a group called the Food and Agricultural Agriculture Climate Alliance, which is being overseen by the DC-based lobbying outfit called the Russell Group, whose clients include big pharma and tobacco companies. Industry, industry groups, including the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, have worked to try to emphasize the sustainability of certain types of cattle production. Here's their message. Quote, sustainable beef is a socially responsible, environmentally sound, and economically viable product that prioritizes planet, people, animals, and progress. But on the other hand, there's a lot of dissonance, I think, in the messaging and the general kind of landscape. Uh, there's polished messages like the one I just, the ones I just read from the industry, and then what I would call paranoia from its members and allies. At the recent UN climate negotiations in Dubai, the FAO issued a food systems roadmap, which was uh, intended to be a guide to help countries align their food systems with the goal of the Paris Climate Agreement to keep warming within 1.5 degrees Celsius over industrial levels. The roadmap mildly suggested. <laughs> uh, that people in developed countries should eat less red meat. More advoca many advocates argued it wasn't robust enough and noted the huge presence of industry lobbyists at the event. There were more uh, beef and dairy lobbyists at the, uh, the COP in Dubai than ever before. Um, but still, the suggestion of reducing red meat consumption prompted this from Congresswoman Harriet Hageman, a Republican from, uh, a Republican from Wyoming. She wrote on Twitter, this was last fall, I think it was, was it already X by then? I don't, I don't know. Um, the, the quote was, uh, they're planning to take away your beef in the name of their climate religion. The globalists at the UN are a, me are a menace, unquote. And there have been so many little taglines like that, like they're coming for your steak, they're coming for your hamburger, and you know, none of which is true if you actually read what's out there. Um, so there's the messaging, and then there's the dollars behind the messaging. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, reporting and research uh, looking into the money and effort that the oil industry has spent trying to influence public opinion on climate change not nearly as much on agriculture, as Viveka pointed out, uh, despite its carbon footprint. Agriculture has a much easier cover. The industry's message is, we're trying to feed your families and keep your food costs low. But the research landscape is changing. In 2021, the journal Climatic Change pu published a study that tracked lobbying dollars spent by the livestock and agriculture lobbies and by individual livestock companies. 
you're probably familiar with the study. Um, the, uh, the authors calculated that U.S. agribusinesses, which include meat and dairy companies and also other agricultural companies, spent $750 million on national political candidates from 2000 to 2020. It's over a 20-year period, but still a lot of money. In the same period, the energy sector, by comparison, spent $1 billion. So $250 million less, but still a lot of money. The same agribusinesses spent $2.5 billion on lobbying from, two, from 2000 to 2019, compared to $6.2 billion by energy and natural resource companies. The report also looked at the contribution of individual companies. Uh, during that time, Exxon spent roughly $17 million on politi political campaigns and more than $240 million on lobbying during, during those 20 years. And in the same time frame, Tyson, the meat giant, gave $3.2 million to political campaigns. And that might not seem like a lot, but relative to each company's revenue, Tyson spent double what Exxon spent on political campaigns and 33% more on lobbying. As the industry is spending more money to downplay the role of livestock agriculture in climate change, uh, the broader industry is em embracing the opportunities in climate change. The Farm Bureau has gone from outright denial to mild acceptance, if only so its members can capture the millions of dollars set aside for climate smart practices by the USDA and the 20 billion set aside by the 2020 Inflation Reduction Act. There's been a major pivot um, because climate change now presents a business opportunity for these companies. The problem uh, is that most of that money is flowing towards big ticket items like methane digesters that only huge farms can afford. These are expensive systems that qualify for IRA and other conservation funding because they capture methane released from these, released from these huge manure lagoons and convert it into biogas, in theory keeping methane out of the atmosphere. But some researchers believe these incentives will only prompt bigger farms to get bigger, in effect to add more cows so they, so they can generate more manure and more methane, sort of a perverse incentive. It's also clear that the majority of subsidi subsidies and crop insurance ends up going to bigger farms and that conservation dollars are going to climate smart practices like irrigation and biodigesters that many would argue are not in fact climate smart. So all of these things together, the lack of regulation, the influence and messaging from the livestock industry and the lobbying dollars, and then you add in the incentives and subsidies that mostly flow to industrial scale farms. And where has that gotten the livestock industry? Where are we? Uh, many would argue it has reached a worrisome place, especially if you care about climate change or animal welfare. Uh, I mentioned the, the ag department, USDA's um, agriculture ses uh, agricultural census, which uh, came out last week. Um, this is a review done every five years of American farms. It's uh, basically a stock take of American agriculture. It found that bigger farms are getting bigger and have more animals in them, while small and medium-sized farms are going out of business. So then if you look at the EPA's greenhouse gas inventory, you'll see that over the years, emissions from manure management from all those huge lagoons and manure pits out there are going up. Enteric emissions are going up, but not as much as emissions from manure, which have doubled over 20 years. So a cow burps regardless of where it is. Um, so I would argue that manure is actually putting all the animals together is the problem. So what we're seeing in the data is clear evidence that storing all this poop in huge facilities with thousands or tens of thousands of animals is a climate problem. The data is telling us that the number of animals is important, but it's how farms can find them that's even more important from a greenhouse gas perspective, and it's getting worse. The group uh, Food and Water Watch found that factory farms are producing 940 billion pounds of manure a year. And since 2017, when the last agriculture census was done, factory farms are producing 52 billion pounds more poop a year. Sorry, again, about the food. Um, so concentration, density, and big numbers on livestock farms translate to more greenhouse gas emissions.
then it means more animals living their lives in confinement in conditions that most human animals would consider inhumane. Confi confinement is a climate problem and an animal welfare problem. The industry and our regulators know it, but they're doing a pretty good job making sure the rest of us don't. Um, so I'm open to questions. I, I normally said so my friends and my family will find this really funny. I'm, I'm normally on the um, uh, the asking questions and listening end. So um, <laughs> so talking for half an hour is uh, was that half an hour? Perfect. Okay. How about that? Yay. Um, so. <laughs>